It is just an honor and a privilege to be in Israel with Yoram Ashery, who's the chief executive officer, the CEO of Novio, which means no biofilm. And this is something I've been, uh, this has been a pet peeve of mine my entire career. I feel like when I got out of dental school in 87, the fillings were all amalgams and every ingredient in amalgam is antibacterial. But the patient, the customer, the consumer wanted tooth colored. So we quit doing these metal toxic fillings that lasted forever. And we replaced them with these inert plastic composites. And, and you know, when a filling was 38 years old and you took it out, and it have a little recurrent decay, you know, a little cavity. These composites at six and a half years, when they fail, it's mush underneath. You're taking a number four round burn, taking out oatmeal. And I've always wanted, um, I always wish the tooth colored filling had an active ingredient. And it looks like yours truly, I'm sitting in front of the man who might be the answer to all my dental composite prayers. Well, we're certainly trying to. And first of <laughs> all, thank you very much for coming. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, really uh, honored. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, let's let's jump right to it. It's exactly that. Um, the an well, 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 for, for, First, tell them who you are. Well, who am I? Yeah, okay. well, I mean, are you a dentist? I'm serving this cause. That's, that's, no, I'm not a dentist. I come from business. And the last 20 years, uh, I've been engaged in taking new technologies uh, from the idea stage to the market and practice and, and wide use. Um, so far on the medical side, I'm a newbie to dentistry. I'm fascinated and excited, but I always look for things that uh, would be close to like products and technologies that could help everybody. And dentistry is a great place so how, so how did you find this technology? Uh, tell, tell us your journey. How, how, well, Israel how is come you found place. it and not all of us dentists listening to you right now? Yeah, so Israel is a small place and people know each other uh, and it's easy to find. I was uh, involved in um, several startup companies who did well, I guess a little above average, uh, more than a little. And so... Um, I just know people and I was directed here and say, hey, here's the one that you may want to look at because it's it's kind of the things you like doing. It's a simple thing from the user perspective, uh, but it can have a big impact and solve big problems. And it's right at the stage that it's, you know, proof of concept is there. Now make it to the product, bring it to the market. That's and, what we're doing for the last the three years here. The proof of concept is that you have something that could be put into a composite that would um, retard um, bacterial growth. Yeah. So two things. One is it's a indefinite antimicrobial or permanent antimicrobial because it doesn't release, it doesn't uh, leach, it doesn't fade out over time. It stays active indefinitely. And it's also seamless because it can be incorporated in almost any material. We're going to talk more about composites because that's what's on the market. It's FDA approved and, and will be available. Uh, and congratulations uh, on the FDA approval. That is not an easy feat. It's not, but it wasn't so difficult either. How long did it take you? Um, I would say overall about nine nine months or so. Nine months? And how much money does something like that cost? Because usually it's a lot of legal fees, isn't it? Um, well, it's hard to count because it's uh, it, it's spread over a lot of different activities, a lot of testing to do, a lot of consulting to do. And the meetings, equivalent so. um, of the FDA approval in the United States is the CE mark in Europe. Yeah, we're uh, that's our next target. We started that. Uh, as the, you know, there's a big regulatory change going on in Europe now, and so things are not clear right now, and a lot of people work. Uh, over there are busy with, with uh, so adjusting. The, the so the EU is changing their... Yeah, the historically, standard. it was quicker to get a CE mark than the FDA, but uh, last couple of years, it's it's actually the reverse. Until the new regulation is understood and, and implemented, uh, and everybody knows how to work So in your business mind, is the United States and Europe about the same size dental market? Uh, um because my interest is usually new technologies, I look at the early days of technology. And in the early days, the U.S. is much bigger because it's faster to adopt new technologies. 
even though maybe FDA is, is, is maybe a little longer cycle. Nevertheless, um, once you get the FDA, things start to move faster than Europe. Uh, it's uh, more homogeneous than Europe. Um, and so when you implement a marketing plan, it's, it's easier to, to implement that across the country, whereas in Europe, you may need to go country by country, work with different people, different opinion leaders, different dealers. It's, again, I mean, Europe from a regulatory perspective could be a one zone, but from a marketing perspective, it's still country by country. And that's, that's the biggest, uh, you know, challenge or effort when you roll out a new technology to the market. Yeah. Just a little advice on Canada. They always want to pretend they're another country, but they're just the, another California state lane across the top. They're, they're the upper loft, just yeah. looking down. Yeah. I think it. Canada <laughs> is more closer to the U.S., not just geographically, but in many other ways, you know, culture-wise and so on, than some of the European countries. Although from a healthcare system, they're quite different. They're maybe more on the European side than right. America. So you found, so somebody referred you in Israel, this new technology, right. and, and when they showed it to you, were they already thinking dentistry or? Yeah, this was actually born in dentistry. Uh, it has a lot of runway in other areas, but right now dentistry is the focus. Um, and uh, what's, what's really fascinating is that it can solve really big problems, but it's pretty seamless for the users. You don't find many situations like that. So if you take, for example, this, uh, uh, this composite syringe, it contains a technology, a new breakthrough technology, but for the user, it's going to feel and look and behave exactly the same as, as composites, that is, as light cure uh, filling composite, resin-based composite they use uh, today. Because we, the technology, the antibacterial technology is incorporated into particles which are based on silica, similar material to the standard filling material or the filler in the glass filler in the composite, the nano, nano hybrid, and so on. And the antimicrobial functional molecules are bound covalently to that filler. So they exert their activity um, and um, anywhere that a bacteria comes in contact or close to the composite. Uh, but from the user perspective, they don't feel, I mean, we tested this, uh, we've given about 30 practitioners to test these materials in a blind fashion compared to some of the uh, most popular brands and they could, couldn't tell the difference. So it's, it's great that you can solve big problems, but without asking your user to, to change their routine or, 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 or anything in their workflow, you just use it the same as. And, and we, we've known about things like this in the past, like we knew, um, that bacteria had a harder time growing under high noble gold uh, than composite because the the high static energy of the gold. Um, what, what was the um, what was the gold crown? Um, what was the popular gold crown before gold hit a thousand dollars? Well, metals, generally speaking, uh, have antibacterial properties because in the presence of humidity, they release ions, and those ions kill bacteria. So some more like silver. Uh, mercury release more than some of the uh, uh, heavier metals, but just generally speaking, bacteria doesn't grow well on metals. And that's, that's kind of the um, uh, generally true. On the flip side, composites, they actually promote growth of bacteria. And that's kind of a, a absurd, but it, it is in fact the truth. Uh, this group published uh, in 2007 a study showing that bacteria grows faster on composite than on just inert plastic. And that's so why where you actually you want to prevent it, you're actually doing the opposite. So biologically, that's, that's composites I, are not such a great material. That, that's today. what we, my opening statement was: that you would take out a 38 year old amalgam and you have a little decay. You take out a six and a half year old composite, and it was mush. Yes. Yes. So they're yes. all the older dentists are so well aware of this. Good composites, they all shrink. As they cure, there's a little bit of shrinkage. And that creates a small gaps, could be 5, 10, 20 microns between the filling and the tooth. And that's just enough for bacteria to leak in, um, even if it's not all around, but in only one side versus the other. There's still that shrinking force causes some, some gap and some bacteria can go in and some nutrients. And then they have a party there and there's nothing you can do. No hygiene or anything can, can stop it. And it's just a matter of time until it grows and grows and you have a recurring decay. 
but with this technology, it, it kills the bacteria uh, right there, and it would not allow those lesions to come back. So you can potentially have uh, restorations that could last indefinitely. So thus, I noticed your composite was named Infinix. Is that Infinix. Infinity? Infinite and Nix gone. Infinite, <laughs> infinity Nix gone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I and the no bio was no biology, no bios, no biofilm, uh, no biofilm. Uh, yes. Because another important feature of the technology, which may be better in some cases than others, but here I think it's it's the right thing. The the, the other problem with the traditional antimicrobials, which are soluble in leach, is that they also disrupt the normal flora and it changes the balance of the microbiome. And you don't want that because it, they're known to have downstream effect, change it changes digestion, and so on. And the bigger issue now, more uh, people talk about it, is resistance, antimicrobial resistance. So if you have a long-term release of an antimicrobial, those bacteria uh, uh, mutate and become resistant. And that's, that's a huge problem today, generally speaking, in the world of microbiology and antimicrobials, antibiotics, and so on. Uh, the beauty of this is because it doesn't reach out. There is no opportunity for resistance, and it doesn't disrupt the microbiome because it only kills the bacteria that is in contact with the restoration and only in that filling. It doesn't affect whatever else you have in the mouth, only where you want that protection. This is where it happens. So what happens? So I'm thinking a little streptococcus mutans rubs up next to this composite, and what, what happens to that, that bacteria? It well, bacteria, bacteria that come in contact would uh, die and disintegrate. It disrupts the membrane structure, it basically breaks it to pieces, and then it just, you know, uh, washes out naturally. Uh, there's no live bacteria uh, in that. So, so when it touches so, it, the, the, when it when it comes in contact with this particle, mm -hmm. it changes the, the membrane and then causes it to die or lysis? Or yeah, the particles contain um, a very high concentration of uh, functional groups. We use different ver uh, uh, versions for different applications. Specifically in these uh, composites, we use a particle which has a silica dioxide core, similar to the uh, standard filler, uh, filler in the composite, and functional groups of, which are quaternary ammonium, and they're covalently bound, and the chemistry is such that it allows a high concentration per uh, surface area on the particle. And when you concentrate all the activity in one point, which is the particle, it's very lethal to the, uh, to the bacteria, to the microorganisms. So as it comes close, you don't even have to have actual contact, but it could be you know, a few tens of microns, uh, which is about the size of the gap. It's already very effective against the, these bacteria. Uh, the quaternary ammoniums are, are, have strong positive charges. It affects an electrostatic force on the membrane that disrupts the structure, the integrity, and then it's called lysis. The bacteria just dies because it's, uh, the membrane is, is dysfunctional. So this is so, I mean, it's what, um, the red flag for me is it's too good to be true. I mean, it works, it's FDA approved. If this works, it's FDA approved. This is going to be what the biggest game changer, the most disruptive technology in um, posterior composites for sure. Um, humans breathe, you know, 18 to 20 times a minute. And I've always noticed where there's a maximum airflow on those skinny front teeth. Um, there's less decay there than in back where you have these big square teeth, the cheeks laying on one side, the tongue's on another. Yeah, it's a most of the recurrences are in posterior teeth. That's, yeah. yeah. So th this would, if, if this works, you'll, this would completely um, disrupt the entire posterior composite market. Um, you know, I think it has a big impact uh, on, uh, you know, treatments and the choice of treatments. Uh, the nice thing about this technology, it can be incorporated in any material. So from a commercial standpoint, we, we will probably at some point open it up to include another material. So we just don't limit this to the Infinix brand, but it can go into other people's brand. And uh, well, so no, just I'm, make I'm, it... I'm uh, not following you. What, what do you mean? You mean you would license the technology to other companies? Well, yeah, we will, we will commercialize uh, Infinix brand, and that will be the lead uh, product to go with. But I think at some point, we will allow others also to use the technology in their formulations. It's it's it, it's compatible with. Well, wouldn't that be the, wouldn't that be the the better direction? Because if there's already 
companies that make, package, and distribute and sell composites mm -hmm. to the world's two million dentists, wouldn't it be easier just to um, get the IP technology, the patents, license it, and just put it in other brands instead of we, starting your own brand? Well, I think it's we thought about that, and, and um, that may be definitely has an advantage. Um, and so we would like to combine the two approaches. So we have our own brand plus also open it up to others. Uh, we're uh, strongly associated with this brand. We use this for the education, for uh, uh, establishing the technology in the market uh, and so on. So I think that would lead in the early days, but um, further out, uh, this could be everywhere. Our, really our mission is to have this available for every, every patient. And so whether it's through our formulation from someone else's, you know, that both are fine with us. So what's the next move? When will the dentists in America be uh, hearing of Infinix? I think very soon. I think they uh, have already heard there's a CE course uh, going to be out on the uh, ADA uh, program uh, soon. We, we had this course uh, live at the last ADA meeting in September. Um, and uh, there's additional educational events uh, in the planning. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, shipping and for supply and so on, uh, that's planned for the first half of next year. We're now getting set up with the manufacturing and everything. And uh, it's, so I think by mid next year, every dentist will be able to, to use this. Uh, so you way, yeah, there's, a, there's a dedicated website, infinix.com. Infinix.com. Infinix.com, right. Okay, and so not and so they wouldn't go, go to nobio.com. People go in and, and reserve a starter kit, so as soon as it's uh, rolled out to the market, we will ship to people a free starter kit, but they can have a first experience. Uh, it's a free starter kit? To get started, yes. yes. Wow, so if they go to no... Um, Infinix.com. Infinix.com. Right. Um, Infinix.com. I-N-F-I-N-I-X.com. They can register for a free starter kit? Correct. And you're waiting until 2020 so that people will see more clearly with 2020? Well, there's some logistical no preparations you because you just said yourself. You'll see, but you'll see more clearly 2020. I got see 2020. 2020. Uh, Worst like joke that. ever. I like that. Okay, <laughs> 2020. I think that's a good karma. You, know, that's so a good karma. It's clear. Yeah. you can see clear. This will be a, a huge game changer. That's a good, that's a good idea. I think it's going to be very beneficial. I think it's going to solve maybe one of the bigger outstanding problems with composites today. So, you know, it's, it has a lot of advantages and the market prefers that, but still has that limitation, which is not insignificant about longevity and the, and the uh, uh, susceptibility to recurrence. Uh, so if we can solve that, I think that could be really... Well, when, when, I, when I look at fillings, yeah, was... um, you know, I say that the dentists, that if you listen to their language carefully, they sound like mechanical and civil engineers. They're building bridges, you know, they're building crowns, houses. Um, it, yeah. To me, but um, it's, it's kind of like they're a farmer and they built this barn and then they tell the patient uh, to take care of it and brush it and keep the barn clean. But the barn always fails from termites. And so I've always looked at dentistry as the dentists are mechanical and civil engineers, and then they get beat up by biology. We don't, we don't, I mean, I look at the fillings that fail. It's not because they break. It's not because they fracture. Yeah. It's because bugs, uh, yeah, eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Um, and then when you look at the research on fungi or working with the bacteria, the fungi are laying down a layer of, um, on the biofilm protecting uh, the, the uh, bacteria from uh, antibodies and T-cells and neutrophils. and That's the biofilm. Which is yeah, the biofilm. Yes, yes. So, so, Black is biofilm. So, it's all, so we, we do all this dentistry and then we lose to other families of life forms. You know, uh, it, so we, we lose in biology. Composites are, are, have this exact problems because they are uh, not doing anything to prevent that um, uh, buildup. Of, of biofilm and you know when people brush their teeth you know to, to remove plaque it's more the mechanical brushing rather than the paste and everything that, that you add those components maybe help to restore some of the lost mineral and 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 fix some of the damage that was caused by 
bacteria lowering pH and, and, and softening the tooth and cause that mineral to, to flow out. So we're trying to bring mineral back and restore the teeth, but you can't keep doing this over, over and over and over. And so we're trying, we're trying to block the problem upstream. So prevent that, you know, biofilm and, and, and pH drop, which causes the, uh, yeah. The and a, and a lot of dentists, tooth, a lot so. of dentists over the years have forgot that, but if you go back and study brushing, um, dry brushing is what, the bristle is what's the soft, straight bristle removing the plaque. That's that's the and, most important thing. And um, there's it's all saying, you know, when you're inside between. Right? Yeah, and um, and when we talk about uh, leaching minerals, I, I almost think of a glass onomer, where you know you have glass onomer fillings, and they like them because they would uh, leach out fluoride and calcium. And but all is an expiration date. You know, right. if you're releasing something, you're you got two, three problems. One is it's not it, forever. You know, it's gonna deplete. Number two, you're losing mass, meaning you're losing strength. Number three, it goes out non-specifically over, you know, release of fluoride or if it's an antimicrobial, even worse, that could have, you know, a, you know, collateral effect. You, know, you just want to protect that little place of the restoration and the interface with the tooth. That's really when you want the protection. You don't want that whole environment affected. Just, just that little place. And that's where that's what's nice about a non-leaching technology that it's really only acting at the local. And what and what areas do you think like that technology? So to me, I, when I think of last summer, I think of Japan, Australia, New Zealand. So I think um, they'll they they've always been aware of the of the uh, biological side the biological side. So I think they'll adopt this. I, I imagine people listening to this right now. I imagine the pediatric dentists are most curious because they have the most challenging patients to get them to brush and floss and not eat uh, crackers and... Well, not only that, it's it's harder to do a case, you know, you got a kid moving in a chair and you, you really need to work fast. And so it's it's another challenge of doing a good restoration uh, in these uh, kids sometimes. So High-risk patients, people with... Uh, uh, you know, lower saliva flow because of uh, medication they take. Uh, elderly, anybody who has a challenge with, you know, keeping their oral hygiene. All these are high-risk patients. About 15, 20 percent of the population are considered high risk for, for caries. 15 to 20 percent? Yeah. And then there's the forgotten 4 percent. Um, 4 percent of Americans um, will finish out their life in a nursing home. And when they go to the nursing home, the average patient gets um, one new root surface cavity a month. So once you uh, put grandma or grandpa in the nursing home, uh, one year later, she's got 12 root surface yeah. cavities. The staff doesn't really like to handle oral hygiene for these. Well, there, you know, I've, um, I went and spent um, an evening uh, in a half a dozen different nursing homes in uh, between Wichita and Phoenix, Arizona, where, and um, it's, um, they're just overworked. I mean, not you would meet a, this nurse, and, our, and it was always an LPN. I wasn't a registered nurse. It was an, a, an, an LPN, a licensed practical nurse, or a um, or there's a CNA, certified nurse assistant. And they would have this entire wing of people, and each one they'd have to feed, bathe, shower, give their meds, brush their teeth, floss their teeth. And what I thought was incredibly bizarre is anytime anyone fell down, the routine protocol was to call the fire department because there was no way this little five foot two girl was going to get this 250 pound, six foot tall grandpa up out of the wet shower and back into bed. And I just thought, this, this is just crazy. But luckily, you and I don't have to worry about that because I noticed that uh, only women live that long. Uh, there's almost no men in a nursing home. It's a tough, it's a tough job. But yeah, so, so root surface decay um, is a huge problem. Yeah. So um, we're... We're starting in restorations and composites, but uh, there's also an adhesive with the same technology, like I mentioned, it can go in, into any other material. Uh, we're now starting to look at uh, other applications for development, so this would be uh, not in 2020, but uh, maybe the year after, uh, like uh, orthodontic cement. And nice. to prevent white spot lesions, it's the same problem, essentially. You got bacteria that's coming in the interface with the tooth, and once you remove those braces, you have the lesion, which is bad. People and by the way, if you're listening to this and you're saying, no, braces have been replaced by clear liners. Um, I've podcast interviewed probably the 50 greatest orthodontists around the world. And 
clear liners is only 20% of their practice. They're, they're still 80% hardwired. And uh, you have some teenage children. Uh, do, you, do you think a, a 14 year old boy would do? Would you give him clear liners and put the ball in his court that he'll wear them all the time? Or would you rather glue those brackets to his teeth? I don't think for children, definitely traditional braces is a better choice. Uh, well, when you when you put on braces, well. the orthodontist is in control. Yeah, and, and you, you also have to follow up and you can sure, make sure that, you know, there, there's compliance with the treatment and there's proper monitoring and proper planning. I mean, you, you're moving bones and so... It's, it's uh, important to get it right. Uh, so what other things do you think about putting in? And analytics is another area. Very interested. You mentioned... Uh, uh, sorry. Um, you mentioned extractions or, or root canals. And, you know, what's the main reason for failure? It's Re reinfection. Infection. Reinfection, right. So if you got a sealer, which is antibacterial, it could give you good peace of mind. Uh, we've we've we haven't uh, we've tested the feasibility of that, uh, so uh, I think so that's, who, that's one of the next next products. So you, you talked about this on this uh, ADA course you did last year at the ADA meeting, mm -hmm. and you filmed that, and you're going to put it online. Who who is your product champion? Who who's your dentist that's going to go out there? Um, uh, well, we're working with with uh, some of them. So at the academic level, uh, we uh, uh, work with. Uh, Professor John Featherstone from uh, UCSF and, uh, you know, the founder of Canberra, the carries a yes. uh, risk assessment. Uh, Legendary. Profession. Yes. Uh, so he's uh, on the scientific side and the uh, disease side. And, and, and what's, what's he saying? Um, I think he believes this is a potential game changer. Yeah. Uh, he's very strongly passionate about this. Uh, we also work with uh, Dr. Peter Rickman. He's the, uh, also at UCSF and uh, uh, head of the restorative uh, science group. And he's actually running a clinical trial now and looking at how this uh, technology, these materials can prevent demineralization or decalcification. And uh, that, that study, I, I believe, will, will uh, uh, report results uh, also beginning of uh, 2020. We'll see clear 2020. That's uh, true. Um, on the KOL front, um, we're uh, uh, very proud of working with the uh, uh, Celerant Group and Lou Schumann, Dr. Lou Schumann. Oh, Lou Schumann yep. and the Celerant Group. Uh, yes, yes. They've yes. done a fantastic job in terms of uh, helping us with the go-to-market and the strategy and, and uh, the media and uh, partnerships and so on. So it's a great partner and helping us a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, they have their... Um, their opinion leaders like uh, uh, John Fluke and Paul Forestine, uh, Chris, Chris Salerno, uh, Mark Jabba, um, uh, Brian Gray from Washington. Uh, so it's a good, good group of people that uh, have, you know, been exposed to this technology earlier on, gave us great feedback. We started working with them for... Uh, I would say more than a year ago, maybe uh, almost two years now. So when, as we started to put the technology into a product and a formula, we started working with these wonderful people in terms of you know getting more feedback, fine tuning things, positioning it correctly, uh, choosing the right applications, which material to do. So we have four products. The right now FDA approved. It's three different composites: universal composite. A flowable and a bulk fill, a deep uh, depth of cure. So basically covering your entire, you know, needs for for restorations and an adhesive, uh, a, a universal bond. It's a prime and a bond to bottle system. Uh, we're actually working now on a one single bottle system that's probably going to be out uh, later next year. Um, so back to these uh, people. So they also help us with the educational uh, programs and the content. Um, some of them spoke at these events. Um, and uh, we'll be working with them and probably uh, more people as we start to roll this out. And of the 56 dental schools, why um, UCSF? Um, well, mostly because Dr. Featherstone, we uh, knew him. Uh, so, so this technology, if we go back uh, almost a decade to the early days, it started at the Hadassah 
uh, Medical Center in Jerusalem and the Hebrew University. Uh, uh, Professor Irving Weiss uh, led the group uh, as one of the inventors. Uh, he's a dentist and a microbiologist and just finished uh, uh, tenure as the dean of the, the School of Dental uh, Medicine at Tel Aviv University. And so he and... Oh, and that Shlomo took over? Shlomo replaced him? Uh, yes, uh, Matalom. Mm -hmm. You know that Shlomo? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I yes. podcasted him yesterday. Is that right? At the university. Well, there you go. He's, uh, what, two months into the job? Four Something months? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Weiss finished about uh, a couple of months ago. So he replaced Dr. Weiss, who's a dentist and microbiologist. And who... one of the founders of uh, Nobio, the chairman and the chief technology officer here. Well, so let's we're... podcast him, too. Let's I... get this from the horse's mouth. Let's let's schedule that. Are he... you here until... Uh, I, I This is day five. I leave tomorrow morning at eight, but we can always do it um um, oh yeah, we just roll. Yeah, we, if, we we can do this long just over Skype. But if he's in a uh, town tonight, or um, or if I can run into him today, I'd, I'd be glad to talk about this because again, this has been this has been um, a dream of every dentist who ever lived through replacing um, amalgam with posterior composite. I mean, I understand the aesthetic health compromise, um, and it's kind of silly, especially um, on posterior. She's like. I'm a dentist. I've been talking to you now for half an hour. I can't see your back teeth. And, um, you know, you see front teeth. And um, and, and girls more. I, I get that. But um, the, um, I mean, my gosh, sometimes it'll be an upper second molar and you'll tell a patient, you know, let's just do a gold on late. Let's cement this with, um, you know, um, let, let's just do this once and right. I, I'm the only person that's ever going to see this unless you go to an ENT. And they say, no, I, I want tooth colored. It's like, you want tooth colored? Well, also no one's there? Oh, yeah. There, there's, there, the, and, and it, it, I call it the peacock effect. I mean, the number one goal of the species is to attract a mate and reproduce and have offspring. And, and it, it all comes down to beauty. Yeah. And, uh, uh, two things. First, I, we did some market surveys over the last year. And one has shown that half of dentists in America are not using amalgam at all. Right. Just zero. Because there's no demand for it. Yeah, so you just focus on composites and that's what you do. And that's, uh, you know, so mixing things. Um, another survey we did was about what's important in selecting a material for a restoration uh, with uh, for a posterior versus interior. And when you look at the posteriors, they properly grade aesthetics as the least or less important, where mechanical performance and handling properties are the top priorities and then aesthetics are further down. When you look at interiors, it's, it's right. different. So aesthetics is, is a very high choice. So I think for the... Um, uh, and since they're in posterior, um, in the anterior fillings, the, they're, they're never going to come back. It's sensitive, it hurts, it's you now whatever. Right. Uh, but in the back, under the compressive forces, um, that, that's a problem. That's why the uh, self-etching primers, like Clearfill SC, you, you go back way back in the day in the 80s, a lot of the bonding companies, um, um, you know, you would do the filling to protocol and you get sensitivity. And so they had this whole team of lecturers out there telling you what you did wrong. You didn't have a rubber dam. You over-dried it. You under-dried it. You... You know, it was always the dentist's fault. But the Japanese listened to this and thought, it's probably the chemistry. And they came out with Clearfill SC and just took over half the market overnight. Um, while the other bonding agents were still all trying to tell you it was all your fault. And as much as you would tell them, I rubber dammed, I didn't under dry, I didn't over dry, but it was, it was still an issue with some patients. And it didn't matter if it was only 5%. If you do 20 fillings and someone comes back and says, it's sensitive. So, so in the back, I think with bonding agents, it, it's mostly driven by sensitivity and then handling. Um, the bulk fills a new thing. That's um, because they're, they're not giving us more money for fillings, but every time the earth goes around the sun, um, the staff all want to raise based on astrology and you have inflation. So you, you have to, um, to keep up with inflation. The insurance isn't going to keep giving you more money to keep up with inflation. So if the insurance is going to hold the fee constant, 
you have to, everything has to pass five fingers. Is this product faster? Is it easier? Is it higher quality? Is it lower um, cost? It's, 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 and you need to compensate by working faster. Yeah. So this sounds like it. it um, um, so so let's go to price. Um, how will Infinix composite these three products? Your flowable, your bonding agent, your bulk fill. How will that yeah, compare I, I don't have to the major brand numbers? numbers? But uh, we, it's gonna be uh, about the same as the, you know, uh, leading materials on the market. So uh, we'll try to. Uh, as much as possible, absorb the cost of the technology and not ask the practitioners to pay extra or maybe a slightly extra, not not significant. So we're talking about maybe the 10 to 20 percent range of, of existing uh, materials. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of prices out there. So there's a lot of uh, channels. There's a lot of dealers. Well, let's talk about that. Will you go direct? Will will millennial dentists on Instagram be able to buy this on Amazon or directly from your website? Or will we'll probably be able to have it in as many places, so both direct and through dealers. Uh, so you'll sell it not exclusively, yeah. yeah. Because I, and dealers are interesting, like um, like you take some companies like um, Dense White Serona, they have some divisions like Cock that only go through distributors. And then they have a division of Endo, Tulsa Dental Product, well, they'll sell direct. Um, Danaher, you know, same thing, no bio care through distributors, but they own implants direct where you can buy it online. Um, some, some distributors, if you sell direct, they won't carry your product, but they'll get on Amazon and sell their own products direct. Have you seen that with Shine? So yeah. Shine has a whole bunch of stuff on Amazon, but if you're trying to sell your stuff through Henry Shine, they say, well, you can't sell it on Amazon. Yeah. So, so that's, that's why I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. Will I be able in 2020 to buy Infinix on Amazon? That's a great question. We have uh, not finalized that yet. We're discussing our our rollout with several uh, parties in the market. Some, you know, some of the big distributors, some manufacturers who want to get involved um, on a limited or co-exclusive or some other form of, of, of you know, advantage, call it. Um, and we're, we're looking at those different options. Um, uh, so, so for the guy who's listening to this, what he's talking about You can probably expect in 2020 to have this technology available through some major dealers, uh, distributors, if you will, and perhaps with some of the major manufacturers. So we're going to have several options of, uh, and also directly from, uh, from Nokia. So then that'd be a no to Amazon? Maybe later on. Not but but on. explain it because but you, you your point is. about millennials buying on Amazon. So I, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty understanding exactly how many dentists actually purchase stuff on Amazon for the practice. Uh, well, there's no major, clear numbers no, out there. Well, no major people are selling on Amazon. Well, you can find almost every product there. Right, through someone else. Yes. Yes. And then, then you have to wonder who who bought who it, bought it and is, is it legit product? You know, um, they call that gray market. Um, did you did you think gray market? So I think for a new tech, it, it's maybe good for the more commoditized things. So you're just looking for the best deal. Or something. If you're looking for a new technology, you prefer to buy from the source just to make sure this. this is so important. so you are so you think you will be able to negotiate selling this through Patterson, Shine, Benko, Burkhart. Absolutely. And selling it directly from your website? Oh, okay. That that we will see that. I'm not. I don't know yet right now. And uh, you know, if, if 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 this is the the issue, we can maybe you know. Uh, it, it's an interesting. It's an interesting um, industry because this is what we call channel conflict, Dennis. Yes. So you're a dentist, and you you get a product, and it's going to come to you somehow, and that channel is very complicated. It's very historical. Um, and this is the way business has been done for a long time. And um, I, I always notice in greater New York, it's kind of um, interesting because four years in a row, Amazon has a booth and it's always like the, uh, I would say they have the men in black people there. You know, there's a couple of guys back there wearing suits and they're, they're privately talking to a bunch of the people, but I, I, I don't know what's happening, but obviously Amazon is looking at this industry, but they, they haven't really busted a move. I mean, four years of Greater New York and nothing's happened. So do you think that the um, industry is so rooted in tradition that's just the way it's going to be? 
Yeah, I think the uh, uh, the, the the distributors are providing value to the customers that is important to keep their practice running. So it's not just about fulfilling an order; it's more about you know serving your equipment and you know expediting things when you really need it today. You know, if your unit is down or you're, you forgot to order something, you want somebody to you know hold. You know, have you, you know, you know so, what I think a big part of it is. I, I think the biggest part of it is when and I, when I launched Downtown in '98, the, the internet was said to have five C's. It was to sell commerce like Amazon, content like news, commercials, connectivity, but community. And I saw my rep coming in once a week as my only link to the outside world. I didn't care if Al Hughes recommended this file A or B, but if I asked him. Hey, what is what is the end on his Brad Gettleman? What what is what file is he using? Mm-hmm. He would know. And and then when you look at cost, um, by the time um, the average overhead sixty five percent, by by the time the dentist pays twenty five cents of every dollar to staff, ten percent to the lab, six percent supplies. That yeah, that's not the issue. I know. And um, so um, you get value for that. You know, the day professional value and, and, we're, running. and we saw that with implants where um, people could buy implants directly from say Russia or China or whatever for $99. But if you have a, a $25,000 implant case Friday and you're missing a screw or you're missing this and, and um, the most value my implant rep would have is, um, Hey, Thursday at the, uh, um, bar and grill up the street, uh, that, that Perry you know, who does 1500 implants, you know, he's going to be there. And these three guys, so it, again, it was that community. It was like, uh, you, um, so I think supplies, uh, being only four to six percent of cost, it's kind of like after you make payroll and pay your lab bill, do you really care what your electric bill is? I mean, every dentist in Arizona could install solar on his roof and get rid of his electric bill. Yeah. But the electric bill is the last bill on their mind because that's that's not your problem. Yes, yeah, so I think the dealers play an important role. And so that's why I would say direct is not the uh, uh, first uh, approach. Yeah. It may supplement in some time, you know, maybe not immediately. Um, I, I think still distributors, and look, most, almost all the major companies uh, like 3M, that's why care, etc. Uh, sell their materials the, through the distributors. And the distributors play an important role, and that's they're they're supporting. Uh, and uh, although they're not, you know, they're kind of indifferent to the to the brand. They don't promote the brand. We'll need to do the promotion and generate the demand for education activities, media, and so on. Uh, I think the the the, the, the practitioners prefer to buy through the distributor because of that additional service, which is, by the way, you see a lot of, so you have the big national ones like, you know, Shine, Patterson, Banker, but you have the regional ones are getting bigger and bigger. And um, I think well, that's the, um, because that personal added value. Well, um, it's the, um, it's the business cycle, you know, Joseph Schumer got a Nobel prize in economics for the business cycle. And at the, um, it's never going to go away because at the end of the day, humans are making all the decisions and um, humans, um, you know, after you've made 10 years of bad decisions, you know, usually it's going to correct, but it's the consolidation, deconsolidation curve. So when I got out of dental school, there was a supply house in every major city, one or two. And then the consolidators, Pete Forsetta Patterson, um, got went public and rolled up a bunch of Patterson, Stan Bergman of Henry Schein, um, Benko, um, um, Chuck and Rick, they rolled up a lot of um, deals. So it all massively consolidated. And then as soon as those four carriers were basically selling 75% of all the supplies, then you started to see it bounce back the other way to deconsolidation. And I've seen a dental supply um, open up. I mean, I podcasted 10 different people who started their own supply house and they're they're opening up all the time. Um, The same thing happened with beer. When I got out of school, there were 15,000 breweries and then the Budweiser's, the Michelob's came along, they consolidate everything and, Pretty much everybody was only drinking Bud and Mick. And then as soon as everybody was, about 10 years ago, it started deconsolidating. So since I've been uh, a dentist, we've gone from 15,000 breweries to mostly just 80% was Bud and Mick and Bud and uh, Miller Lite. And now it's deconsolidating and there's a brewery on every corner. 
So I think that it's the human cycle. Once the total industry is completely de uh, deconsolidated. It's like a pendulum. And I yeah, yeah. That I remember that, that first video game was that Pong. He had these bars and he bounced the ball back and forth, that Pong. It's the Pong between consolidating, deconsolidating, consolidating. So that's just a cycle. But on that note, right now, um, private practitioners like me in the solo office, we've... Uh, We've shrank about 7% in the last uh, 10 years, and we've been replaced by DSOs, which are expanding um, um, the number. It depends on what you call a DSO. When you say DSO, most people think of like Heartland that just passed 1,000 locations or Bob Fontana with 700 or Aspen 700. Um, but I notice in business strategies, a lot of people, um, you were talking about your strategy to go after the independent practitioners. Uh, with um, um, your what you say earlier, but some people just sit there and say, "Well, gosh, I just go get Heartland to realize the value of this." Um, there's a thousand locations. Um, what do you um, do? You see that as a, do you have a DSO strategy? Because, uh, because we, if Heartland places a bunch of fillings that fill with recurrent decay, they're going to have to replace a lot of these for free. Yeah, I, I think DSOs are interesting from uh, you know. As far as technology, um, uh, because they may have maybe more resources to evaluate, and it's a, it's a, let's say, you know, a business decision. Uh, practitioners, um, part of the reason these cells are, are growing is because they have those horizontal resources. You know, if you're a solo practice, you need to make all your decisions yourself. Plus, you know, about you know which technologies you're using, how, all the practice management around it and so on and, and take care of patients at the same time. The DSOs has a little more of that uh, scalability and so if you want to introduce a new technology, I know they're more price uh, uh, aggressive and so on, but uh, yeah, again, the scale is, is obviously important, especially when talking about the, the larger ones. Um, and uh, yeah, they would, you know, realize the economic benefits of the technology like this to know less recalls. Uh, for example, so not just the patient satisfaction and the professional satisfaction of doing a better job, but also it has a financial benefit um, to that. So, uh, uh, I, yeah, I think DSOs would be uh, another important component of um, Gordon, you know, rolling this out. Gordon and Christian was here two weeks ago in uh, yeah. Tel Aviv. Um, yeah. Did you talk to Gordon and CRA? And um, and then there's another there's the dental advisor with John W. Farrar Farrar in uh, Michigan. Have you talked to dental John at dental advisor? Or we we talked to Gordon. Actually, we we met uh, a couple of times in Provo, uh, Utah. So uh, that's uh, I didn't want to uh, you know he came here. He was had a lot of people to see. So uh, unfortunately, doesn't come here as often as uh, as people want to. Uh, but um, uh, Gordon is a uh, is a good uh, friend and and, and uh, very aware of this uh, technology. And by the way, his Mrs. Rella Christensen, the wife of Gordon, PhD in microbiology. She's a microbiologist. She's a, she's a great microbiologist, and uh, she does a lot of work in this area and published uh, a lot in this area as well. Um, some of her um, uh, really. Uh, um, innovative work about characterizing um, uh, bacteria in in decay in cavities uh, has really changed very, everyone's view. Yeah, change, yeah. I mean, like people I used so to blame everything on S yeah. mutants. Yeah. Yeah, well, guess what? You have a lot of decay yeah. with no S mutants, right. for example. So, right. you know, this is very basic scientific uh, data that can, you know, who knows how that may change treatments down the road. And uh, she's done some very innovative work there. Uh, I mean, she's uh, she's identified a new species of bacteria in the mouth several times. Mm -hmm. I mean, this one was like Marie Curie. I mean, she's amazing. Yep. Has, or has she said anything specifically about your product or technology? Well, we're collaborating. We're planning a study together. Uh, so that's something also that will start, uh, I think. Uh, what about John in uh, Michigan with Dental Advisory? Have you showed this to him? Um, not yet. We're, you know, we're a little still early in the, you know, early uh, rollout. And so uh, and then there's, these are all people that we 
definitely want to. And then my soul and sacred um, uh, we're, uh, reality. And we're working uh, with the folks from the American Academy of Cardiology. It's a relatively nice. new uh, society. I think it was started four years ago, but it's it's growing quite rapidly, and they're focused specifically um, uh, in this. Uh, in this area, when they uh, when they meet, do they just eat cheese and crackers? And so the American <laughs> Society of Cardiology, so they do. They just sit around and eat crackers. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a lot of important people that we uh, still have to speak to and uh, get uh, more involved in this project. Well, you need to tell this woman here that before I leave Israel, I want to talk to the uh, the dentist and microbiologist and. Recently retired Dean Shlomo replaced the um, inventor of this technology. And um, my gosh. Professor Reverend Weiss? Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, we try to get him in here uh, this morning, actually, but uh, even though he retired, he's uh, still. You know, schedule is is, is, yeah. is impossible. But uh, well, let's try to get some done. You said you're leaving tomorrow morning. Yeah, I'm leaving tomorrow. Uh, so uh, when we finish, I'll. I'll yeah. Sorry. And or when I get back to Phoenix, we can always do it over Skype. Uh, yeah, Skype. Skype yes. But um, yes, I'm. Uh, so any anything else that you want to talk about that I missed, um, forgot to bring up? Um, wow, we covered uh, quite a bit. So um, yeah, I uh, no, I think that's a uh, that's a good it's got an overview of uh, of this technology and uh, some some of the things you said better than I would so I appreciate that <laughs> well you know it's funny because um when you study philosophy they said Socrates said humans had two great um, they live between fear and greed those are the two great emotions but that's a um, that's the framework of a human being thinking like that because um we're we live in the biosphere and everyone is either preying on something to kill and eat you know, a cow, a chicken, uh, a plant, and something's preying on us. We live between predator, or we're either predator or prey. And when we place those fillings, the minute we place those fillings from our human homo sapien framework, other life forms who want to live just as much as you want to live are looking for a source of food. And um, the more we move this game of dentistry um, to biology, I mean, and I understand occlusion, you know, it's karyo, perio, and occlusion, and, and there's some exciting stuff coming with occlusal disease. I think we're around the corner from finally getting a, an objectable measurement uh, from all these uh, scans and Invisalign, you know, you, uh, you have, you have, when you take x-rays, you can see cavities. Uh, with gum disease, you can probe, you can see measurements, but for occlusal disease, you don't really have um, an objective measurement. And, um, but my gosh, care, the, the, at the end of the day, carries is the big game, especially for the kids. Um, and um, anything we can do to give Homo sapien an advantage over uh, bacteria and microorganisms and microbiology is just going to be a game changer. And I want this to be the biggest game changer because. Well, you know, bacteria, on the one hand, it's part of us. There's about three times more bacteria in you and me than human cells, all right? So right. It's, we're more bacteria than human, if you like to think about it. Um, but it, it's a symbiotic uh, relation, and it's important. We don't want to disrupt that because that's really part of us. So only when you have the problems, you need a very focal uh, intervention just to make sure that it doesn't have the bad consequence. In this case, we're talking about caries or recurring caries. Um, if you think about it, the bacteria are, are really driving the cascade of tooth loss. You know, you start with initial decay, and then you have a recurring decay once, twice, and then you have a root canal, but then that gets infected, and then extraction, you get an implant. But that doesn't, still bacteria, it doesn't, you know, leave you then. You have periodontitis. And if you have a, a denture, you can have denture stomatitis, same thing, which then it, it gets contaminated. That's usually candida. It's a, it's a worse actor than the strep mutant. Um, and that can also have systemic consequences. You know, a lot of uh, 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 airway uh, pulmonary complications, especially in the elderly people. So um, oral health and bacteria are together and we need to control them. And I think that what's exciting about Nobio and the Infinix technology is that really it can play a role in each of these 
treatments in the uh, from the prevention to the right now we're focusing on the restoration and that's kind of where this thing is going to roll out initially but uh, we we really aim for the entire continuum starting from the prevention to the restoration the root canal the implant so I think that's overall going to have a big impact on that industry and this war's been going a long time like when penicillin was discovered it was being made by a fungus to fight bacteria. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the penicillin fungi is where we got penicillin and humans are what, 50,000 years old and they figured out a way to generate penicillin and kill fungi probably a hundred million years ago. So it's a game that will always be evolving. It'll always be a changing. And I can, um, even if this was perfect success, I'm positive within a million years, the bacteria are going to figure out a way They're around this. They're going to outlast us. Yeah. <laughs> or we'll learn, we'll learn to live together. You um, know? <laughs> but on that note, um, seriously, um, you're a busy man, and thank you so much for making time for me to come in and invade your space, sit at your desk, and um, thank you for sharing an hour with my homies. It was an honor to podcast you. Well, thank you very much, Howard. I appreciate you coming here, and really uh, honored to speak to you always.